Okay, this morning I have some good news, I have some bad news, and I have some really bad news. Which one do you want first? All right, we'll do good news first. Uh, The good news is I'm going to tell you this morning how to love life. That's a bold claim, but I really believe that. The Bible uses almost exact, those exact words. I'm going to tell you this morning how to love life. We're starting a new series. It's a series about relationships, including marriage, but not just marriage. So if you're married, this will apply to you. If you're uh, newly married, if you're divorced, if you're single, if you're widowed, if you have a, a brother or a sister, a parent, a child, if you have anyone in your life that you talk to on a regular basis, this will probably apply to you because this is about relationships. And I'm going to tell you how to love your life, even in the most difficult of relationships. And in a room this size, we have some. That's the good news. The bad news, this is going to be a difficult sermon to hear and an even more difficult sermon to implement in your life. Teachers of Scripture are often hard. They just are. God challenged us to be more like Jesus, and Jesus is sometimes hard to follow. Not, not hard to follow like he's grading you, and if you don't get a straight A's, he's kicking you out of class. God always loves you. He always pursues. He always is willing to forgive all of our shortcomings. But hard to follow like he lived a remarkable life. He made many difficult choices, and then he invites you to use his life as a model and to follow him and make those same difficult choices. It's hard. Uh, now, the, the encouragement for you is, as hard as this is to sit in a room, especially if you're in the middle of a difficult relationship, as hard as this is to sit in a crowded room and hear this message, it's a little more difficult to stand in front of a room and deliver this message. So you could be switched places with me, that'd be even worse. But the really bad news, this is true, the really bad news is not that we're going to deliver a hard message. The really bad news is that some of you will think I'm crazy and not try it. I mean, what I'm going to say this morning is so countercultural, so uh, counterintuitive to what you would think on your own. Some of you will hear it and you won't, you'll think I'm crazy. And the bad news is, the really bad news is you'll miss out on the blessing that God has. Because in the passage I'm going to read, he says he wants you to follow in his steps so that he can give you a blessing. And some of you are going to miss that. And that's really bad news because some of you need that blessing this morning. If you get your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. It's page 679 in these Bibles here, Matthew chapter 6. Take one of those if you can make use of it. Uh, We'd love for you to have that. Now, if you are a student of the Bible much at all or have been very long at all, you know one of the most important things to do in teaching the Bible or interpreting the Bible is to take things within the context that they're written. So you, you take a verse, not by itself, but you read before and after. And does this make sense? Is this what the, the writer was trying to convey and all of that? And I just want to say up front, the verses I'm going to highlight this morning out of Matthew chapter 6, I'm taking them completely out of context, which is really bad. You shouldn't do that. But I'm going to. I'm going to take them completely out of context. Um, and I wanted to warn you about that ahead of time because they come smack dab in the middle of a teaching about money And that's not what I'm talking about, but I'm going to apply it anyway. So just want to tell you ahead of time, taking it completely out of context. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 says, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. If your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So the the two verses right before this are talking about money. The The verse after this is talking about money. So he's talking about the way you see money. That's what he's describing. And the way that you view money, the way you view your life in regard to money, can fill your light with life and light, or it can fill it with darkness and difficulty. But the way you see it matters so much. I mean, look at the three verses before this. It's all about money. Verse 19 says, Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, thieves break in and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven, For moth and vermin do not destroy, thieves do not break in the steel, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's saying we can choose to believe the lie that more money will make us fulfilled. If you want fulfillment in your life, more money will do it. More stuff. Store it for yourselves. More treasures. More trinkets. More items. That'll make you fulfilled. Or you can see things differently, and you can choose to believe that true fulfillment comes from God and see through that lie, and you'll find real life and doing that. And if you look at the the verse after it, it goes a step further and says you can become a slave to your discontentment and that your discontentment will actually pull you away from full devotion to God. Look at the next verse, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one or love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. 
So he's saying you can actually see the world, see your money, see life so much through the eyes that says more will make me happy that you'll actually pull yourself away from God. Your discontentment will fuel yourself. So I'm taking this completely out of context because this passage is about money and I'm not talking about money, but I'm sort of not taking it out of context. The eyes are the lamps of our entire life. And I think you can apply this passage, even though it's out of context, towards relationships. You can believe the lie that a different spouse, or at least an upgraded one, will make you fulfilled. Or you can see the world differently and say that in my relationships, true fulfillment comes from God alone, and you can allow him to help you see through the lie that the world teaches. And just like money, you can become a slave to your discontentment, and you can see things so much that way that it actually pulls you away from your devotion to God. And in the same way, you can become so discontented in your relationships because of the way you see them that you can actually become a slave to what this dream you have of what they should be or could be, and it's going to pull you away from full devotion to God. So I'm taking it out of context, but not totally. One of the biggest lies in our culture today says that if you found the one, quote unquote, that all of your loneliness, all of your hurt, all of your dissatisfaction will just simply disappear. And that's not true. That, that, that there's one person who will meet all your needs and satisfy all your longings. And you can allow your eyes to see the world and all of your relationships that way. And you can say that all of your discontentments because they're not the right one or they're not the right action. Or they're not, and you can believe that. But if you do that, by that standard, your spouse will fall far short. And you'll grow to a place that you can only see their shortfalls. That's all you'll see. And you're, the way you view the world will fill your life with darkness. In fact, by that standard, any spouse will fall far short, and you will grow to a place that you only see shortfalls. You only see things that are not true. The truth, the Bible says there is someone who will meet all your needs and satisfy all your longings, but you're not married to them. That person is Jesus, and he's the only one who can do that. And if you put anyone else in that category, you're going to see their shortcomings glaringly, and you're going to destroy them in the process because they were never designed to be that for you. We're starting a new series today called Blink. Any guesses how often do you blink in a day? Anybody know? You blink 15 to 20 times per minute, about 20,000 times in a day. All just without thinking about it and, and those sort of things. In fact, this will comfort you on your commute tomorrow. Smithsonian Magazine estimates that we blink so much that during our waking hours, 10% of the time our eyes are closed. So when you're driving on 65 in the morning, 10% of the people around you have their eyes shut at any given moment. Just, just know that's true. Scientists actually break down tears into three categories. There's tears when you cry. That's a certain kind of tear because you're emotional. There's tears when your eyes are irritated, so like you're chopping onions or you get dirt in your eye or something. There's that kind of tears. And then the third kind is just the maintenance tears, and they call them basal tears. I don't know why they call them that. But they just keep your eyes from drying out. They keep dirt and dust off the surface of your eye. They just make everything work the right way. 20,000 blinks a day. So what happens is a little bit of those tears are emitted on your eyes, and when you blink, it shoves them to the, actually inside, to the tear ducts, which are in the middle by your nose, and it drains out, drains out through your nose, all of that dirt and dust and all of that sort of thing. Or the course of a day, your eyes produce about a quarter of a teaspoon of basal tears. Now, I'm telling you this because if you're not a believer in God, I think this is a challenging thing to consider that your creator created you in such a way that over the course of a day to maintain your eyes, you have a quarter of a teaspoon of basal tears divided by 20,000 blinks. That's like one eighty eighty thousandth of a teaspoon of basal tears every blink, and it happens multiple times a minute without you even knowing about it. And he did that to keep your eyes all, if you don't believe in God, you've got to figure out how that happened because that's think it's kind of a cool thing. Apparently I'm the only one who thinks it's kind of cool, but I think that's pretty amazing. <laughs> It cleans up the debris. It, it keeps them tender so they can see clearly. And I want to suggest to you this morning that to have a successful marriage or even a successful relationship, partnership, whatever, you've got to learn to blink. You've got to learn to be able to reset your vision many times in a day, over and again. You must change what you notice. You must change what you notice first. You must change what you notice most. You've got to learn to blink. Look how the Bible describes love, and how it requires vision. 1 Corinthians 13 is probably the most famous passage, not only in the Bible, but just in literature, about love. It's many of your weddings that you've attended is included in that. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, love is patient. Patience requires a vision that's correct. When do you get impatient with your kids? 
It's when they do the same thing over and over and over and over and over. If, if it builds up, that's when impatience comes in. Love is patient. Love is kind. Kindness requires that you see this person as deserving of your effort and your kindness. Love it does not envy. So you, all the comparison stuff, that's all about the way you see. And in fact, I love the New, Living, the New International Reader's version of that verse. says, love does not want what belongs to others. Now, the reader's version, if you're not familiar with that, is the, passage, the Bible that's written for children. It's third grade level. And kids cut to the chase, right? Love doesn't want what belongs to others. It says it does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. You dishonor someone else because you think they're worthy of that dishonor. It's a vision piece. Love's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. When do you get easily angered? It's when you build up records of wrong. So love does not keep any records of wrong. Right there in the next, the next verse. In fact, I love the New Living Translation. It says love is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. For me, that seems stronger than record of wrong. It's not like this hypothetical list of all the mistakes they've made. It's all the mistakes they've made towards me. And love doesn't get irritable because it takes those away. You've got to learn to blink. It says love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes. I want to stop for just a minute because hope is a vision thing as well. And if I could give you one item out of this whole list, like the whole list, if I could package and put it in a, with a bow, one item and give it to you out of this whole list, it'd be hope. If you're in a difficult relationship, marriage or otherwise, the very most important thing for you to have off this list is hope. When I talk to couples who don't have hope, when both sides have given up hope, they're in trouble. But if one or the other can hang on to some hope that this can make it work, God can help it out, it's going to get better. If one, and sometimes you trade who has the hope. But if one person can carry hope, God can save almost any marriage. But if both lose hope, it's, it's often over. But it's all about vision. Love always perseveres. Love never fails. It's all about the way you, you see. You have hope. You see this can be a different thing. The message version of that last part says, Love trusts God always. It always looks for the best. It never looks back but keeps going to the end. You cannot do that if, if you're seeing the world, seeing your spouse, seeing yourself with incorrect vision. If your eyes get off, none of that works. So there's 15 attributes. If you look at that list, and you can count through them uh, now or later, but there's 15 different attributes of what love looks like. And by my estimation, nine of those, go to that next screen, nine of those are about vision. If you're going to love well, if you're going to be a successful marriage or relationship, you've got to learn to blink. The Apostle Peter in his book, 1 Peter, talks about a lot of things, but specifically he talks to husbands and wives. It's one of the uh, handful of times in the Bible where he talks directly to them. And, and he starts that passage out in kind of a funny way. He says in 1 Peter 3, 1, wives in the same way, and then he goes on to describe what wives should do. And he says husbands in the same way, and he goes on to describe what husbands should do. Now we're going to if you're in the life groups, the notes this week, dive into those sections. We're not going to take time to do that this morning because i got more to get to. But I think it's interesting that he says by do it in the same way. What's he talking about? Well, the, the Bible, all of the verses and chapter headings, we don't, they weren't in the original Bible. It was just a letter that was written. We've added those to make it easy to all look at the same place or turn to the same place. But that wasn't, and there's all one big passage. And so you've got to go back a little bit to kind of get context of what the same way he's talking about is. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 says, Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. And let me stop a second, because people get confused about all this. The Bible's not endorsing slavery. It never says everybody should have a good slave and be a you know, slave owner. It never says any of that. But he's talking to people who are slaves... And they don't have any power to change that. They can't vote in a different election to undo the slavery. They can't rally to change. The, they, they have no options. Their options are, in the middle of this really difficult situation, do I act in a godly way or do I not? That's the options they have. So he says, submit yourselves to masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For, because it's commendable to, if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God. So because a slave is aware of God and they choose to go through a difficult situation, God notices that. It honors him when they do that. He says, but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? That's a harsh statement. 
But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this, I highlighted it because I think it's, this is the thing, this is commendable for God. What is the this? The this is when you face a difficult situation and you could not handle it godly, but you handle it godly because of your awareness and faith in God. You choose to go through this difficult thing because of who he is. So when it says husbands in the same way, it's commendable to God, husbands, when you face difficult times and you endure it, not hardship because you're a jerk, that's not commendable to God at all, that you're emotionally absent or you're angry or you're drinking too much. You face hardship that way, that's just on you. But when you're doing the right thing and you face hardship because of him, because you're a follower of the one who suffered for you, that's commendable in the same way, he says. Wives, in the same way, it's commendable to God when you face hardship and endure it. Not hardship because you're a jerk. That's not, not gender specific. <laughs> Both of us can be jerks. Not because you're nasty or rude, but because you're a follower of the one who suffered for you. That's commendable to God. Verse 21 says, To this, same idea, you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you and me an example that we should follow in God's steps. To this we were called. What is this again? Facing hardship with a Christ-like attitude. When you go through a difficult time and you do it in a God-honoring way, that is commendable to God. It's, it's an example he's left for us to follow. When I choose to live, see my life in a way that it's not all about making me happy, fulfilling my wants and wishes, but instead about making him happy, when I can reorient my vision that way, it changes everything. Let's go on. Peter puts some, some feet to this. He puts some specifics. Verse 21 says, To this you are called, saying this, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should also follow in his steps. For he committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to one who judges justly. Peter wisely points as the example the only one who he could follow in this regard. You know, if Peter would have said, you should, you should be uh, kind when you face hardship, just like me. Then his friends would have said, Peter, you're a jerk sometimes. <laughs> That's not true of you. He doesn't do that. He says, you should do it the way he did it, because Jesus did it the right way, and you should follow his example. So let me ask you just a couple of questions. Has there ever been anyone who lived life better than Jesus? Like, just think about it for a minute. You don't have to answer it out loud. Has there ever been anyone who lived life different, better than Jesus? Has there ever been anyone who mastered relationships better than Jesus mastered relationships? Has there ever been anyone who lived a more fulfilled life than Jesus lived? Not necessarily fulfilled in the way we think of it, but true fulfillment. Has there ever been anyone who met Jesus' standard on any of those categories? I would suggest no. So Peter wisely points us to the one to follow in this life, the one who mastered relationships better than anyone else, the one who found true fulfillment more than anyone else who did life better than anyone else. And what did he do? Peter gives us specifics. He says Jesus did not retaliate. Even when Jesus was insulted, he didn't retaliate. What would change in our homes if we chose not to retaliate? Not to retaliate with angry words, not to retaliate with hurtful examples from the past, not to retaliate with silence or cold separation. We chose not to retaliate at all. Now, I know what you're thinking. I mean, I, I, I know how this works. You're saying to yourself, but if I do that, they'll walk all over me. I'm like, if I do that, I won't be respected. If I do that, fill in the blank, this terrible thing will happen to me. That's why Peter starts by talking about Jesus, because has there ever been anyone who lived a more fulfilled life than he did? And he didn't retaliate. So if we want to, if we say, I can't follow that example because if I do, I won't be happy. I won't be fulfilled. I won't have things go the way I need them to happen. Life will be terrible. Relationships will mess up. If I say that, I'm being dishonest with myself because Jesus, who had the most fulfilled, best relationship, best life in history, didn't retaliate, even when he's insulted. He had an amazing way, Jesus did, of handling difficult situations. I think he understood the ways of God so much better than I do. And because he understood them, he came from a whole different place. James 1.20, Jesus' brother James wrote, God's righteousness does not grow from human anger. And I believe that Jesus understood this. So he came from a different place when he was insulted because he understood what his ultimate goal was. 
He understood his main goal wasn't to stand up for himself. His main goal wasn't to be respected or to get his own way. So he chose to handle his anger differently. Now I want to make sure I'm clear on something. All of the most, I said most, most of the video representations about Jesus, the movies you watch about Jesus' life, I hate most of them because I think they really do a disservice to Jesus. Most of the ones you watch, Jesus is like this drab, sullen, uh, flatline, emotionally guy who never showers. I don't know why he never showers. That's this true, too. His long, greasy hair, always true. But he walks around all kind of half, half there. I don't think that was my Savior. I think Jesus laughed a lot. I think he cried when he got upset. I think he got angry at times. I think he, he got disappointed. Jesus felt a full range of emotions. He's probably more in touch with who he was than anyone ever. So I don't think he was never angry. The Bible describes him being angry, but he didn't allow his life to grow up out of that place because he understood that God's righteousness does not grow from anger. So he was constantly purging himself of anger. And if you're going to be successful in life, you have got to purge yourself of anger. So how much is enough? How will you know you've done that well? You'll know you've done it well when you get to the point of being insulted and not retaliating. Because Jesus, even when he was insulted, didn't retaliate. I, I've been a pastor now for quite a few years, and over the years I've done a lot of marriage counseling. We still do that, by the way. If you, if you need help, um, come talk to me. We'll, we have a marriage mentoring program that's great. We'll pair you up with somebody here in the church who can walk through things with you. We have counselors we refer to. I do some marriage counseling. would love to help you if this raises any issue that you need to work through. But I've done a lot of that over the years, and used to, I did it from a really bad place. I didn't understand what I was doing. And so I would sit down with a couple, and when I knew they were coming into a marriage, I was immediately trying to figure out, okay, who's right and who's wrong? Because one of them's the right spouse, one of them's the wrong spouse. Let me figure that out, and then I'll you know, take 15 seconds of their time. I'll tell them the right answer. We'll move on to this, you know, get this thing done. And that was really stupid. I um, appreciate your you know, compassion with that, but it's really stupid. And so I realized over the years that it's never that clean cut. Like, it's almost always 50-50. There's almost always enough fault to go around. Like sometimes it's 55-45 or 60-40. It's rarely more extreme than that. There's almost always enough fault to go around. And what that means is it's not one ogre jerk and one hapless victim. It's two people in a lot of pain. And they've come in hoping that God has an answer for this. They've come in hoping there's a thing. Now, now by the way, they think it's unbalanced. They never think it's 50-50. They always think, if I can get Andy in the same room, he'll get on my side and we'll beat the fire out of my spouse and tell him it's their fault. I mean, that's what they're hoping will happen. But it's almost always 50-50. You know, often marriages get to the point where they go back and forth with this retaliating. It becomes a war zone. And just like in war zones, no one wins. A war is only who loses less. And just like in a war zone, kids often pay the biggest price. Galatians 5 says, if you go on hurting each other and tearing each other apart, be careful or you will, be, you will completely destroy each other. And man, I've sat across from so many families who are living Galatians 5.15. Jesus didn't retaliate. Jesus also didn't threaten. Since Jesus, when he faced hardship, even suffering, didn't threaten. He made no threats. Now, in marriage, our threats aren't typically about violence. If, if that's true in your marriage, then let's talk. For sure, we want to help you. But typically, that's not what this is. Typically in marriage, the threats we face are not threats of violence, but threats of ending the marriage. They can be casual statements like, well, maybe we should just get a divorce. And some people use that like as the, the winning hand in poker. Like if I lay that down, I throw a divorce out there, I'll get my way because they'll, they'll back off. Or they can say you know, more direct, like if you're going to keep doing that, I'm not sure I'm going to stick around. We just float that out there for fun. Often the threat of divorce is not spoken as much as it's pondered. So a fight will happen, each goes to their own corner, and then they just allow themselves to think about, maybe this is not the right one. Maybe we'd be better off if we weren't together. Or maybe I'd be better off if I was with somebody else. And they kind of allow those thoughts to, to go for a while. Can I just say, without this is no judgment, this is no judgment, as kindly as I can, if you allow divorce to hang out in your mind, in your marriage, it's going to cause real problems. It will eventually lead to the undoing of your marriage. You know, in Spring Hill, many part marriages, both partners are overworked, they're over busy, they feel taken for granted, and you throw the threat of divorce, spoken or un, inside of that thing, and it just causes all kinds of mess. 
if it's actively considered by one or both partners, your devotion will begin to be a roller coaster. So I'll be kind when I feel it. I'll be good when I feel it. I'll be loyal when I feel it. And, and it goes up and down with your mood and emotions, and your marriage is in trouble if you allow that to happen. Your devotion, your kindness, your forgiveness, your loyalty have to stay constant even when your emotions go up and down. Philippians chapter 2 says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility let each of you regard one another as more important than yourselves. Jesus never threatened, even when he's in a lot of pain. And if I could encourage you to remove divorce from your language and your mind, like the chances of your marriage succeeding go way up if you just get that off the table. Third, Jesus entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Now, first hour, I, I told this, and everybody looked at me like I was a horrible person, but often in marriages, uh, people have a mental scorecard where they're trying to evaluate all the time if I'm a better spouse than my husband or wife is. And so they're saying, well, I did this, but they didn't do that, or I didn't do that, but they did, and they're, they're back and forth keeping score. And I know that never happens to any of you, but sometimes that happens in marriages. And yet Jesus... Jesus didn't do that. He entrusted himself to the only one who could judge justly. Jesus gave the scorecard to God and let God keep track of it. How much freedom would you find if you gave the scorecard to the only judge worthy of deciding? Because you're not worthy of deciding in the moment. You're, you're too biased, you're too hurt, you're too offended. So if you've got the scorecard, you're, that's not going to be right. What would happen if you gave that scorecard to God? I love this Romans 15 passage. It says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, accept one another then, just as Christ has accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. God gives the endurance. You see that? God gives the encouragement. Pray about that. God can unify your minds. He can make you one. He does that. God can help you learn to accept each other, even when you're driving each other crazy. And when you do those things, God gets the glory. God gets the praise because he's done something supernatural. I mean, the idea that two people can be together and be encouraged and endure and unified and accepting, that's not normal. So God gets the glory when that happens because he did it. I got to this point, like I wrote my uh, notes. I thought this point, like people are going to be like, what are you, like where are we going with this? I'm not, not sure. I think the bottom line from Peter and from me this morning is to hang in there. Hang in there. If you're in a marriage that's going pretty good, you're still driving each other crazy sometimes. Hang in there. Some of you are in marriages that are not just difficult, they're destructive. You know, divorce is a difficult, terrible thing. There are occasions where divorce is the best option. But I would say to you, don't go to divorce quickly, and don't go to divorce with you the only one judging that. Get people involved in your life. If, it's, if you're in a destructive marriage, get some help. Come talk to us. We can point you in a good direction, but get some help. Don't just say, my marriage is destructive, I'm going to do something else. Like, get some help. But for everybody else, in between the two kind of ends, I think God would say to you, hang in there. Don't retaliate. Don't threaten and trust yourself to the one who judges justly. Now what I love that Peter does here, he sets this up and then says, husbands and wives in the same way do that. And then he, he wraps this passage up in chapter 3 with some encouragement. And I think we need that because this is a difficult message to hear. First Peter chapter 3 verse 8 says, Finally, in conclusion, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this, there's that same word again, to this you were called. So that, why did he call you to this? Did he call you to you just to destroy your life or make your life a mess or make you hurt and pain? Why did he call you to this? To this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. God wants to bless you. And this is the pathway to get there. For, because, he says, Whoever would love life and see good days. Do you want to love life? I told you I was going to tell you how to get there. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. 
They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For God is watching. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are attentive to their prayer. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You and I were called to repay evil with blessing. It's especially true if you're a husband or a wife. God says we do this so that we may ourselves inherit a blessing from him because he's watching. He's attentive to our prayers. So do you want to love life? Do you want to see good days? Then keep your words in check. Seek peace and pursue it. Don't retaliate. Don't threaten. And trust yourself to the one who judges justly and wait for your blessing, which is yet to come. God's watching. God's listening. And trust yourself to him. I want you to bow your heads and let me pray for you, if I can. God, I thank you that you give us endurance and patience for a difficult teaching like this. Especially for those who are here this morning who are in pain. For those who are feeling the weight of of a, of a difficult marriage, maybe one they've been in for a long time that's been hard for a long time, or, or for those who are coming out of a divorce and trying to figure out what, what your plan is for them. God, this is all hard. I love how you, you are specific that this is not just so that it pours on more pain in our life or so it makes it difficult or so we can face this hard time so somehow there'll be something. Like, like you say, you want to do this because this is the path to loving life. This is the path to endurance and encouragement and freedom. And God, we don't want to believe that. That doesn't feel true in our spirit. It feels very counterintuitive, very countercultural. But God, I believe that the way we learn to see, if we can reset our eyes and our minds and our spirits again and again every day, God, you can bring healing to some some battered homes. You can bring healing to some troubled lives. You can bring healing to those who do not have hope that you can bring healing. So God, I'm asking that the people would put the weight of their life in your hands. That they'd put their marriage in your hands. They'd put that relationship with their ex in your hands. They'd put the, the hurt from their divorce in your hands they would put the, the struggle with their children or their parents or their co-workers in your hands. And they would learn from Jesus to, to live life in such a way that they don't need to retaliate. They don't need to threaten. And they, they trust to your hands the scorecard. Why don't you pray to God and put whatever it is that's heavy right now in his hands. He can carry that. You don't need to carry it anyway. Take it off your shoulders. Take it off your back and put it in his hands. Pray for forgiveness for you, wherever that's necessary. Pray that he would help you forgive those in your life, wherever that's necessary. For some of you, you may need to start by just saying, God, I'm putting me in your hands. My life's a mess. It's not where it needs to be. And I acknowledge, God, that you're the only way to make life work. And so I, I want you to be in charge. I want you to be my Lord and my Savior because the things we're talking about are so supernatural. We can't do it on our own. So some of you need to start there by giving your life to Christ. Once you pray, respond to whatever God has said to you to do, and then I'll pray to close this.